Now, all right. So I'd like to officially call to order our curriculum instruction and student life subcommittee meeting, st excuse me, standing committee. It is Wednesday, June 10th at 7.02. The meeting is being recorded and we also have BevCam with us streaming the meeting on their YouTube channel as well as uh, channel 99. And just want to make note that uh, thanks to Governor Baker's uh, modifications to the open meeting law guidelines, we are able to meet virtually uh, and not in person. Uh, we will start with the pledge. Um, Ms. Abel, would you like to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? It would be my pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. I pledge allegiance. allegiance. To, to the, the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America, America and to the republic, republic for which it stands, stands one, nation, one nation under God, under God indivisible, indivisible, with liberty, liberty and justice, justice for all. Thank you. All right. So before we, we go any further, I just want to uh, give some a great shout out to our young adult who organized the Black Lives Matter walk today. It was inspiring and so much more. It was just so well done. The students did a phenomenal job of pulling it all together and seeing that many people in the community come together and show their love, their support for um, such, such important cause. It really, it was um, just a moving. So I just want to start off by thanking everyone who helped make that happen. And now we'll go into, do we need roll call um, to start uh, to take attendance? Yes. Okay. So I will, Laura, I'll let you do the roll call. Sure. Thank uh, you. Ms. Freddie? Yes. Ms. Abel? Yes. Mr. Conan? Uh, yes. Dr. Flaherty? Yes. Ms. Hildreth? Yes. Ms. Sudak? Yes. Mr. Giagni? Is he here? I think he's not here. I can see him. Um, okay. And Ms. Kirsten is also absent as well. Yeah. Mr. Milady will be. Is, um, and Mr. Milady. Yeah, right. he is missing tonight. All right. Thank you. Uh, the first order of business is the approval of the meeting minutes from May 6, 2020. Do I have a motion to approve those minutes? I'll make a motion to approve the minutes from our last meeting. Thank you. And any a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Flaherty. Any changes or um, additions to the minutes? All right, why don't we take a roll call vote on, on that? I'll turn it over to you, Laura. All right, uh, Ms. Ferretti? Yes. Ms. Abel? Yes. Mr. Conant? Yes. Dr. Flaherty? Yes. Ms. Hildreth? Yes. And Ms. Sudak? Yes. And then the others are absent, thank you. Thank you. I am here. Oh, sorry. Um, I had to flip through. Who is that? That's okay. Karen Goodno McGuire. Oh, no, oh, Miss Fry. Hi. What do you vote? Yes. <laughs> okay. Thank you. All right, great. And the next item on our agenda are updates from our student representatives. Did we have uh, any students with us this evening? I know it was a busy day. It was a busy day. As I scrolled through, um, we were expecting Ibrahim, but I did not see him on the call. Okay, well, we'll pass over this and if they do join us at some point before the meeting, they could um, loop back in and, and give us any updates they may have. Uh, and Dr. Flaherty, I will turn over number four to you, an overview of senior week and graduation activities. All right, great, thank you. Thank uh, it's, you. Been a, it's been a busy week and as you said, I just wanna uh, echo your earlier thoughts that today was an amazing day and was so proud of our young people um, for the, the work they did and the powerful um, sense of community and message and, that we were able to send out. So um, it was, I was very proud to be part of Beverly today. 
um, and to be part of the rally and walk that happened. So um, it started almost two weeks ago now with all of our senior activities. And I believe Betty Taylor was gonna do an overview and I don't know if she's joined us yet. Betty, are you here? Yes, I am. Okay. Hi, well, good evening, everybody. Um, that, uh, let me back up um, to make sure I've hit everything. Um, the uh, senior week activities were maybe a little bit longer than a week um, in that we started first with our um, uh, uh, student awards, which is a, um, usually is a live ceremony where teachers nominate, give academic awards to students in their classes. Um, what we did do is uh, send out letters to the parents and the students congratulating them on the award and telling them the award that they received and sending in a certificate. And then we, our teachers each videotaped a message about why they thought this student deserved an award. And that's available on bhsonline.org. Um, uh, that also we had our um, baccalaureate, which usually is a nice tradition, but usually we don't get a large group. Um, one of the things we saw in our senior survey is kids wanted to say, get a chance to say goodbye to their teachers. Um, so what we did is we invited both students and teachers to send any message they would like to send out to the senior class. Um, and we were fortunate for um, Montserrat um, College of Art offered us a graduate animation student um, and what she did was take all our videos, add some animation, did a great um, roaring uh, panther at the beginning of it and put all those messages together in a 20 minute slide uh, a video presentation. That too you can find on bhsonline.org. Um, we also, with the work with, of guidance and assistant principal Julie Ferrara, um, uh, managed to announce our scholarship winners. Um, I believe it was over $16,000 in scholarships. Um, actually, I think it was more than that. I think I'm off on my number of students that receive scholarships. So all the scholarship recipients are listed, again, on our school's website. We were fortunate that at, we have a branch of the Institution for Savings in the school and they offered to pay for signs for all our seniors. So we had senior portraits on the signs. And um, on a Friday, we had over 65 staff members volunteer to de uh, deliver the signs to seniors. They did about three or four um, uh, people each. Um, and so those were all distributed on that day. And then we finally came to graduation. Oh, wait, no, I forgot one other thing. Then we had the rolling rally um, where uh, staff from all over the school district um, were uh, situated along the sides of the parking lot and the sidewalks. And the kids started at uh, Beverly Middle School and went down um, uh, New Balch, Cabot, and then Herrick, and then Sawyer, and came through the campus and went round while their teachers uh, wished them well. That was a lot of fun. The teachers enjoyed it, and I think the kids enjoyed it, and parents enjoyed it too. And of course, we had an escort from the Beverly Police Department and the Fire Department. Um, then we had graduation. Now, we had to do a hybrid um, following the Board of Health um, requirements for, for large gatherings. And so we had uh, people report in a car with their family members um, at certain times starting at nine o'clock. And the students could get out of the car with their family members. We had a stage in front of the school, their names were called, they came up in their cap and gown and received their diploma. Um, our PTSO, um, agreed to contract with a professional photographer, so every graduate will get a five by seven photo of them on stage holding their diploma. And then they were escorted off the stage and we had areas further down for photos so families could take their masks off and take family photos of, um, you know, with their child. Um, the, it went really smoothly. The weather was a little gray cloudy and we had two short, very short showers. Um, but at, at four o'clock we were finished with it and all our students had received their diplomas. So it was a nice day in that. It wasn't like our traditional ceremony, but I think what was nice is families could get really close and see their child receive the diploma and they certainly got lots and lots of pictures. So I, I hope it was a good day for everyone. Thank you. Thanks, I, I, I just wanted to say as, as someone who went and observed and participated in, in a lot of the events that you described, 
the comments that I heard from the parents, from the families were overwhelmingly positive. And, and they just, what I heard the most at, at a couple of the events, in particular the graduation and the rolling rally is we should do it this way every year. <laughs> and, <laughs> and you are correct in that, you know, it was such a, it was so personal and I, I was in the front night, many grandparents and, you know, family members that would be so far away normally got to be right up front and take the pictures, have, and the photo opportunities, especially at graduation, were amazing, you know, with the school in the backdrop and the Beverly High School sign. I just, I applaud everyone who made that come together. It, it really, um, you know, I expected it to be wonderful but i did i really was surprised at how lovely everything was and how happy all the families were good great job thank, thank you. you i appreciate that and I, I i do have to first of all give a lot of credit to my administrative team to mark thomas and julie ferrara phil Kader, and dan keith because they did all the real organizing and hustling yeah. and then again our staff stepped up and about 30 staff members stayed for the day and helped us with the moving of the cars and the escorting the people to the picture site so it was a real team effort i i did i noticed that and the teachers were it, I think the most challenging part of the day was not being able to hug <laughs> the students. Yeah, there's a and lot of this. <laughs> it, I know, I know. And and the I think the students themselves, I, I witnessed just a lot of tears of joy. And, um, you know, the teachers were, it, it was touching, the, just seeing the interaction so close up. And it was a very personal event, which typically it, it isn't because of the magnitude of it. But just all you and all your staff, everyone did a phenomenal job. So, thank, so thank you. you. And I, sh I should say also the speeches were um, on video and running that day on BevCam and BevCam is putting a video together with the whole day and they're splicing the kids receiving their diplomas with the videos. And we have some musical performances from the band and the chorus as well. So there'll be a nice, uh, overall video that'll be um, sent out into the community soon. Great, thank you. Thanks, okay. Betty. I, and again, I just wanna echo and thank um, the team and the, by her team, I mean, Betty, her administrative team and the teachers, they really did um, work to try to make this very special for the students, although it was very different than what they're used to in traditional. There was a lot of heart that went into it, but it's also a major um, logistics um, competition to get that all put together and the day just ran so efficiently and and as did the rolling rally I think the adults enjoyed the rolling rally just as much as the kids did if not more um, I said it was so wonderful to see people with arms and not just in little boxes um, and we were cheering and it was just it was a real celebration of the whole community and and I have a feeling that that one might end up becoming uh, something that people want as a new tradition. So sometimes good can can change and, and still be um, special. So I thank everybody for all of their efforts because um, it was a monumental task in the middle of trying to still run the end of the school year for all the other students. So now we're on to the closing of the school year for everybody else. So thank Dr. you, Flaherty. team. Can I say something to Mrs. Sure. Taylor? Or Dr. Taylor, uh, I'm a parent of a senior, and I also had a senior last year, and um, we really enjoyed the graduation. Like you said, it was very nice to be able to see so close. Uh, we did enjoy the rally very much, um, and the other thing that really meant a lot to my senior was the number of teachers that were at the rolling rally and at the graduation. So, given that they didn't really, you know, have a chance to see their friends or, or their teachers, it was nice for them to have such a large representation at both of those events. So thank you. Well, thank you for the feedback. That's good to know. And there, are there any other comments? I can't see all of the boxes. So Mrs. Ferretti, if you can help roll that uh, with the screen up, I can't see everybody. So are there any other comments that I don't, okay. and, and I should have said this in the beginning too, that due to the obvious limitations here, if we do not see someone, feel free to speak up and, and announce yourself and do it that way. We can abandon some formalities of hand raising when, in these times. All right, Dr. Flaherty, I will let you take over the 
the next item there, on the agenda this, as well? This is, uh, an exciting, a lot of exciting work to talk about here. Um, we're trying to really get um, all of our curriculum onto a um, review cycle. And this year we started with social studies. And the reason for that is that there were changes to the standards uh, that came from the state. And so that was um, driving um, the reason to start with um, social studies. And so what you're going to see tonight and the reason it's coming forward um, for us is to share kind of the exciting news with you with sort resources that we've chosen. But because of a change in the sequencing and when U.S. history happens and in eighth grade, a move to um, a more civics curriculum, as well as a civics and citizenship um, theme throughout all of middle, uh, elementary and middle school social studies, um, it's a substantial change. And because of you have a policy, IGD, for curriculum adoption, um, these, the social studies piece will fall under that um, policy and because it's a substantial revision to curriculum. Um, and so what I'm going to do is I want to talk a little bit about um, the elementary and eighth grade um, choices that we made. And then we have, uh, I believe, our eighth, three eighth grade um, social studies teachers were coming and we do have one teacher that will be presenting. And then um, the high school will present um, a recommendation that they have um, for a new high school curriculum. Um, and then we wanted to share with you a new intervention program. This one does not need a vote, but we wanted to share with you a math intervention program that we, um, software that we will be bringing forward or we will be using next year as a pilot um, at the middle school. So let me start by talking a little bit about uh, eighth grade. It's called Democracy Lab. We've chosen to go with a um, company that we use quite frequently and is very well known to um, educators as um, quality work in um, when it comes to the uh, social studies realm. And Primary Source and Generation Citizen has have worked together and they were actually awarded um, a DESI grant per se. They're going to be designing both the middle school and, um, and having some influence on the high school work as well in developing curriculum units for teachers. So it was also good to be um, involved with them already. We use them quite heavily for some professional development. And so we were aware of their work and they have designed um, a great resource for um, eighth grade and it's called Democracy um, Lab. And so what I'm gonna do is I will give you just an overview of everything that the package will contain. And then we can present you with um, a sample unit and walk you through what it would look like. We had originally um, had on here civil rights because it does have a unit of civil rights, but um, in honor of the work that our great young people did today, we actually changed it. And I'm gonna give you an overview of the youth activism and citizenship um, piece. So the Democracy Lab overview, this will show you all of the pieces that will be contained in the um, materials that we purchased. And so you can see that they have developed um, civics curriculum with over 110 lessons and it has a multi multicultural and global voice perspective um, when it comes to that it's very interactive and in inquiry based it has the um, online it's very um, technology based as well so if we have to stay in a remote for any length of time this will be a great tool for our teachers um, we also liked that it has the civics connection to it um, right built into the curriculum. And the strongest asset for me was the fact that it has a very strong professional development component to the overall curriculum. And this is a three-year process. And so the teachers will be given um, ongoing professional development throughout the, um, the process of those three years. And it also has a large bank of resources and connects teachers to a professional learning community where they can access um, their peers and and work with them as well. So that's an overview of um, what will be contained in it. And then I will show you, um, oops, the nine units of study that will be contained within the Democracy Lab include ancient and global foundations of the US political system, um, British and the indigenous influences on the US government, youth activism, citizenship, 
citizenship and social change, voting in elections, which will be very timely um, as we are going into national elections this coming year. Uh, the Supreme Court, they'll look at the 14th Amendment and civil rights, um, civil rights and access to education, a free press and informed community, and uncovering the world of news production, and then ending with Generation Citizen and Action Civics. So these are the nine, oh, nine units. I'm not gonna read this for, to you because you all have this information, but it just shows you how each unit is, is set up. It will start with an overall description um, with very clear um, content expectations of what students will be learning. And then it follows up with what are the essential questions for the unit. So in this unit that we're working on for citizen, uh, for student activism, you can see that there are five essential questions that look at the rights and responsibilities of citizens of the United States. What do these, um, who is left out? Uh, whose rights and responsibilities are circumcised? What channels of participation exist for all US residents to participate in civics and political life? How does that constitution allow for protest and change, which is um, unique and luckily for the United States, that's a right that we all have. And how young people have participated in political life and fought for change in the past. Um, and then it will give very clear learning objectives. And for this unit, students, this is going to tell you what students will know and be able to do by the end of each of the units. For this unit, students will be able to describe how the Constitution and US law defines the rights and responsibilities of its citizens. It will analyze how rights and responsibilities are extended to different groups of people. And we'll look at that historically. It describes the avenues for political participation um, that are open to citizens and non-citizens, youth and adults. It will portray a good citizen, what it means to be a good citizen of the United States and the world. It will describe and analyze the role of political protest in our democracy. It will, students will be able to list and explain several examples of political protest. And I think that you'll see them work in all of the recent protests that have been happening. And it will describe the goals and tactics of political protests led by young people. Um, and now I would um, welcome uh, Brian, if he is with us, to be I able am. to talk a little bit. Our eighth grade teachers were able to look at this earlier in the fall. We did apply to be part of a pilot group that, were, that would have been able to use it this year. We were not selected, um, but now that it has come um, online in order to purchase, um, we, the, the teachers um, gave us good feedback. We liked what we saw, and so we'd like to, to implement this for the first cycle. So Brian, would you like to share the thoughts of your teachers? Yeah, um, first of all, thank you. This is tremendous. This is really exciting. Um, I've, personally, I've taken a number of classes through Primary Source, which is the organization that this is going through. Um, I, I'm not familiar with is it Generation Citizen. I, I, I don't know about that organization, but Primary Source, I've taken a lot of classes from. And everything they do is top notch. and. Um, really engaging, and I've brought a lot of what I've learned from those courses into the classroom. Um, uh, we were excited that we would potentially have the opportunity to do it, and we were, of course, disappointed when we realized that the, the grant wasn't coming through. Um, so to have it actually happen is amazing. So the past year and a half, we've put together um, you know, our curriculum, and we had a, a really good year, I'd say. It was a weird year, obviously, because of everything that's happened. But, but for, civics, for a civics teacher, it's actually a pretty kind of a good year, if <laughs> you think about it. Um, but we had a really good year of trying out all these materials, trying out um, everything new for us. And, and there was de definitely times when we, when we thought, wow, that didn't work. We, we can't wait to try again next year. So to have um, all this material coming our direction, um, for us to, to go through and work with, that's obviously really exciting. The more stuff we have at our disposal, I feel like the better off we are. I think um, one of the things that I'm really excited about in terms of Democracy Lab is the opportunity to, for collaboration and feedback with a larger group of civics teachers and social studies teachers. So the PLC that they're offering is really exciting to me. Um, I know 
from my experience with primary source that the um, quality of conversation that you can have with people in that environment is, is amazing. And the more um, conscientious and um, articulate people you have in a room talking about um, what, what they think are the most important things that our young people take from a civics course, the, the, the better it gets and the more um, ideas you can have bring to your own classroom. So I'm really excited about the PLC aspect of it. Another thing I'm really excited about is um, Primary Source is an organization that really grounds itself in um, global education. And I think that it's um, very important right now that we be teaching civics and American history as something that is situated in the world, not just something that exists in a vacuum of the United States. And so I'm excited to see that they have that question right there. What does it mean to be a good citizen of the United States and the world? Because I think that it's really important that we um, figure out how to effectively teach US civics um, as something that is not only um, US centric, but something that we can carry forward and create global citizens with. So I know primary source is going to have a real interest in, in that angle as well. So yeah. Like I said, thank you. We're, we're pretty pumped about this. That's awesome. Thank you so much for coming tonight to share your, your enthusiasm, because I know that that will go through to the students as well. Any questions about the eighth grade? Okay, so we have also, um, we're going to pilot um, a some curriculum for grades three through five, also through primary source, um, as I said, that they were given, um, awarded the, um, the planning grant to, to design curriculum for um, model curriculum for DESE um, with the standards. And this is a um, still in development. It will be out and ready for use um, this September for grades three through five. And then you might be thinking, well, what's gonna happen to grades six and seven? Cause they're kind of left out in the middle there. Um, and they will be designing curriculum that will be available for grades six and seven in the following year. And so we will watch that development. Um, but I just wanna give you an overview of what um, the civics curriculum will look like for grades three through five. And one of the things that jumped out with uh, for me is that this um, lends very nicely with our project-based learning and um, that uh, some of the schools have already started to implement projects in these areas. So. Um, just uh, briefly, when we look at grade three, that will be focusing on Massachusetts history, which is a big um, change in the standards. And there is a big um, component of Massachusetts history throughout um, many grades of the standards. Uh, but it will also focus on geography and the interactions between Native peoples and European settlers. Um, so if you have, I know that uh, there's um, a lot of the, the third graders did the Wampanoag. Um, pro there was a project-based learning uh, that went on on that. So this will work right in with a lot of that project base that's happening at the elementary level. Grade four will look at North American geography and ancient civilizations. And this looks really at the expansion of the US and movement of peoples and then the five regions, um, their environments, natural disasters, peoples and cultures. And then grade five will focus on American, uh, early American colonies, the revolution um, and early republic principles of the US government, slavery, civil war and civil rights. So all of this, again, just underscores and can work beautifully with um, project-based learning for our younger students. You can also see in the, um, I'm not gonna read all of them, you had the materials, but um, the civics questions that really um, hone in and provide a really strong foundation um, for students as they move up um, into the uh, upper middle school grades and uh, the high school. And as we said, this the teachers have not had an opportunity to work with this, um, but it, it does align very nicely with the work that, that many of them are already doing. And so we will pilot this. This is only a one-year commitment. Um, and we will ask for their feedback um, as we go through the year next year to see if, it, if they find it to be a valuable tool um, that we would move forward and then budget for. So this is just a pilot year um, that we'll be doing with them. It's only a one-year commitment. Any questions on grades three through five? 
Okay, I'm going to turn this over to um, Betty and, and her team to talk about TCI Brings Learning Alive, which is what is being recommended for use at the high school. Um, and let me just give you a quick overview. In 2018, the state revised the um, standards and frameworks for social studies. And among the changes in standards was also a recommendation in the sequence of courses. Um, the senior class that just graduated would have taken world history there in ninth grade, US one in 10th and US two and 11th. Now the recommendation is that students should take uh, U.S. history in nine and ten, and junior year should be world history. So, uh, this past year's freshman class were the first to begin uh, taking U.S. history. Their sophomore next year they'll be taking U.S. two, and it's not until either juniors that they're world history. So, uh, the department has been in in um, working on aligning the the standards and taking a look at what um, what they need. At the same time, our contract with our text provider, Pearson, ran out. We had that for 11 years. Um, and so the department took a look at some other sources and resources they would like, and they've settled on this particular text. I'm going to turn it over. First of all, I want to thank uh, Liz Hefner, who's our department facilitator, Julia Brotherton, who is uh, one of our social studies teacher, including APUS, and uh, Paul Casey, who's one of our freshman academy teachers and teaches also US2. Um, so they, they can speak particularly to the text. I believe Paul is going to do the actual presentation. And then if you have any questions, they can um, handle that. So Paul, if you want to take it away. All right. Thank you, Mrs. Taylor. Uh, and uh, thank you for having me. Um, as Mrs. Taylor said, uh, I think it was in the fall, um, the administration approached us as a department and um, asked us if we had any recommendations for new resources. Um, you know, we, we looked at some more traditional resources, but almost immediately I was a, a, an advocate for um, TCI, uh, which is probably why I'm presenting. Um, but as was uh, Mrs. Brotherton, who's here tonight. Now, just as a brief history, I. Um, I was introduced to TCI by uh, Mrs. Terminello, who I don't, that was on the list, but I don't think she's here tonight. Um, and she was a new teacher at Briscoe Middle School where I was teaching eighth grade world history. Um, and she had done her student teaching at Danvers High School, uh, which at the time was completely indebted to, to TCI. Um, so she introduced it to me and it was a fairly new company back then. So uh, to get a lot of their resources, you just had to give them an email address and you got a 30 day free trial to the majority of their, uh, their resources with the exception of the text. Um, and after that 30 days would run up, we would be really savvy middle school teachers and just put a new email address in, but, um, they've gotten pretty smart to that. So I think they realized there were, you know, not five Paul Casey's teaching at Briscoe middle school. <laughs> uh, now, uh, unfortunately you do get a 30 day free trial. They give you one activity to try though. So, um, you don't get quite as much, uh, or excuse me, resources as we got back then. Um, however, just to speak to it uh, briefly, um, basically what TCI does is, is like a traditional textbook or text or resource, um, it will give you all of the, you know, the, the text that the students can read and, and primary source material and whatnot. Uh, however, what it does offer with each unit um, is on average about three um, hands-on simulation activities uh, where the students collaborate with each other. The teacher becomes more of a facilitator um, and they, they really learn um, through doing. Um, and what I put here was this, the 21st century skills and, and project-based learning, which I know is a goal of the, um, of the district. Um, but it was really, we were feeling like we were doing PBL back then with this resource. And I know that one of the, when you, I talked to my colleagues, one of the biggest challenges with PBL, especially for history is, um, you know, we think of PBL as these six week units and how can I, I'm only going to teach one idea in six weeks and I, I'll never finish my curriculum. Uh, additionally, you know, we, we have a difficult time maybe finding materials and resources that are proven to have worked with other teachers. Um, so I know a lot of teachers are, are you know, weary about trying PBL. Um, what I like to think of TCI is as like, a bunch of mini PBLs. Between US 1 and US 2, there's roughly 60 um, of these hands-on simulations that last uh, around one to two class periods for us. Um, but really what it is, they, they are ideally uh, 
PBLs. The students, again, they, they problem solve, they collaborate together and the, and the teacher, um, you know, with limited resources for the students, maybe just a type of activity uh, becomes more of the facilitator. Uh, each one of these activities comes with an essential question and a learning objective that at the end, um, you know, the students have had so much fun actually participating in these simulations and activities. I think they forget their learning, but they can very easily, you know, answer the essential question and, and align with the learning objective at the end. Um, what we found when using this at the, at the middle school that many years ago was that uh, as teachers, we were, we were willing to collaborate, not because it, it was part of a, a directive or um, because we were supposed to, but because we wanted to. Um, the students were enjoying the activities so much they would ask to do them again. We actually, when we had lunch duty in the middle school, we would hear the students talking about the activity we had just done uh, at lunch, which I know is shocking, um, but for us it was too. Um, and I actually even had a couple activities that students at the end of the year, the last week of school, when you're kind of wondering what you're going to do with your with your students, aside from saying goodbye, they'd say, hey, can we, can we do that plague activity? again that we did three months ago and uh, it was actually it was a really rewarding experience um, to say the least so uh, I think that what we'll see with this with this resource is especially for, you know for me in the ninth grade but also moving forward with 10th grade us2 uh, is teachers kind of working together doing the same activities and, and students kind of getting that same information and um, and enjoying themselves um, and lastly, uh, a, a couple summers ago, I had a, an opportunity to uh, take a, a professional development um, with Dr. Brad Austin at Salem State, who was one of the key writers of the new standards. Um, and one of their, their biggest sticking points with, with us was that we have to begin teaching history from every perspective, not a new perspective, not one perspective, but every perspective. Uh, history for so long has been really taught from, from one perspective, and one type of people. Uh, and I think now more than ever, as we see today, we need to start stepping in and, and, and teaching or allowing the students to learn about multiple different perspectives. And what these simulations do is they allow students to uh, kind of engage in other perspectives of history through a variety of, of activities uh, and learn you know, what it's like to be somebody I think we lost you. I think we lost Paul. Yeah. Froze up. Um, well, maybe he, yeah, maybe he accidentally hit something is out and is coming back. I don't know if uh, Julia or Liz can sort of, I don't know if you can finish his thought, but uh, if, if you can speak to the inclusive classroom piece. Oh, sounds like maybe that. I can't finish this thought, but I'll fill in until he shows up again. I'll just say that I'm I'm super excited about the idea of having this curriculum. I've been aware of um, History Live for a really long time, and unlike Paul, never had a chance to actually to teach with it. But I've had my free textbooks in my classroom um, for a long time and used it kind of on my own in a number of different ways. And what I really like about it, um, have liked about it. I'm excited to hear what Paul's saying about it because it sounds great. I I really like. Um, each unit's focus on an essential question, you know, the understanding by design approach to education so that, and, and these are like thought provoking, um, deep um, types of questions um, that students should be asking about history and out about our, you know, our country. So it's focused around founding ideals, um, the most kind of prominent of which are liberty and equality. And there's been that tension in our history between those two for such a long time. And um, it gets students to think about those things by asking them these questions and then by getting them to engage in um, you know, debate and simulations and putting themselves in other people's um, shoes. I'm just super excited about the idea of having this curriculum and that we will all um, be using the same thing and be able to have conversations about it together as a department. So thank you so much. I don't know if Paul's back or if there's anything else. I am you... back. Sorry about that. Okay. So, all right. If could Julia or Paul um, comment on um, the strength of how this will help you if we have to stay in a remote type setting um, and if that will make it easier for students to be able to access your curriculum? Paul? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's, it, it's, I think, I believe we're buying the license. I believe we're buying an online, an online license. So it will mean that, you know, it's your standard. There, it is a textbook, so we can assign that. But then I'm, I'm assuming when, uh, my 30-day window ran out, so I couldn't look at it. 
um, again for today, but that there will be some activities that we can have students do um, remotely because we'll be, it, it's all online. That's what we're really purchasing. We're not really buying too many hard copy textbooks because we know we won't really be using those. Yeah, and I, I think, um, you know, as we kind of, this was an, obviously new for all of us with online learning and mm -hmm. uh, how, to, how to navigate it. Um, I think that as we as we move forward, uh, you know, if we're all here on Zoom meetings with our students, I think there's going to be more opportunity for us over the summer to learn how to how to utilize that better and how to get the students kind of talking to each other instead of us just talking. Yes. Um, and many of these activities do, you know, they lend themselves to pairs and groups, and it might be that they are on groups by themselves when we're not there, then they ask us questions. I, I think there's opportunities, certainly. I think it'll be more challenging, but um, I, I think it's doable. Great. Are there any other questions? If not, this the, the two um, blocks here, both the Democracy Lab, the three to five and the high school social studies curriculum, we do need a, a vote um, uh, to recommend adoption of these uh, materials and uh, curriculum revisions to the full school committee. Okay, so do you wanna make a motion, uh, Dr. Flaherty? Sure. A formal I, motion and then we can. I would recommend that we um, ask the school committee to approve the curriculum revisions and the um, recommended curriculum materials for social studies in grade eight, grades three through five and for the high school. Okay, and I would second that. And Laura, do you wanna do a roll call vote? I will. Perfect. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Freddy? Yes. Ms. Nebel? Yes. Mr. Conan? Yes. Dr. Flaherty? Yes. Ms. Hildreth? Yes. Ms. McGuire? Yes. And Ms. Sudak? Yes. Great. That passes seven to three or absent. So. Great. Thank and you. On Thank you so much. We're so excited. This is going to be such um, an exciting and great opportunity for our students um, at all three levels of school. So that'll be great. I'd like to introduce um, Kate Tromley now to talk about a, a math intervention program that we will pilot next year at the middle school. Thanks, Dot, and thank you for having me here tonight to talk about uh, a new program that we are onboarding. Um, this is a product called Exact Path, which is put out by the Admentum program um, company. And we, uh, just to give a little bit of history, we went out seeking something um, to help us as a supplemental tool, particularly in grade five, as we started to see some app fatigue, if you will, um, with ST Math. Although we love our ST Math program, it is being used in the elementary schools. Um, and so the students that are currently sitting in grade five um, are starting to get a little bit of an app fatigue as we um, ask them again as they're tr transitioning to middle school to, to log on to the same program. So we wanted something that um, would provide this, a, a similar experience with hands-on learning. Um, but we are always kind of um, thinking about how can we move forward in our math curriculum while also spiraling back to any um, foundational concepts that maybe a student hadn't mastered yet. Uh, so lo and behold, after some research and some recommendations, um, we met with uh, the uh, exact path reps and we were really excited and really um, taken aback by their uh, presentation and thought that it would be a beautiful uh, fit for our um, learning model at the middle school. Um, it's so much so that we felt like this could be very beneficial to six through eight as well. Um, so to give a little bit of a background as to what the program will do, um, it's aimed at closing kind of that achievement gap, but also accelerating learning for all students at all levels. It's adaptive. Um, so when the student signs on for the first time, they take an adaptive assessment that will place them somewhere um, at their own personalized learning level along the K through 12 curriculum. So there's also um, an appeal to um, how discreet that individualized learning can be for a student in middle school that may be um, still learning well below curriculum level, but then also a student at the opposite end that may need some additional enrichment and opportunities for extension. Uh, so 
once they log on and take their formative assessment and, um, and they are placed somewhere in the program, there are kind of two prongs to the program in that what, um, the teachers will have, each student will have their own playlist, if you will, um, of their own personalized learning pathway. And then there's also a component where teachers can push out the current math lessons that are going on, whole group, small group, and individually within the classroom. So when a student logs on, it's really meant to be kind of a personalized learning pathway for reinforcing whatever concepts they're working on, both in the current curriculum. So if it's a grade five student, it's the grade five lessons that are going on. But if that student um, may have a, uh, an area of weakness in a grade three standard, they would then go um, on their own whether it be during a learning station or for a homework assignment, and they would be able to practice that um, third grade skill um, at, in their own personalized way. Uh, it is a combination um, along the pathway of a mini lesson where the uh, content is um, presented to them. They then interact with a hands-on with different hands-on tools. They take a, uh, another little formative assessment in order to move on. And if they don't um, have a mastery in that particular lesson, it bumps them back into kind of a different approach to instruction. Um, it is aligned with the Khan Academy uh, videos so that there's a lot of extra supplemental materials. Um, and also there are some dashboards that include um, personalized pathways for extension. So if students are the type of student that logs on and, and takes an assessment and places well beyond grade level, there are some um, lesson plans and project plans included within the program that can be pushed out to those students for extension and enrichment. Um, all along the way, it gives a beautiful analysis of growth, progress, and individual student data that can be used for, to support small group instruction. So um, right within the program, there's a teacher dashboard uh, for data analysis that can allow them to group students um, in small groups. Uh, and it's also, we feel like, a, a, a good partner as we look ahead to the fall and know that we may be in some sort of hybrid or remote model because, again, everything is personalized um, via an app. So um, really the aim is that they would be doing their practice, their skills practice within the app, and then the teachers would be lifting out areas um, that have flagged for additional support or additional extension um, for small group lessons. And they would be driving some of their um, lessons based on the data that the students are providing. So uh, we are excited to onboard it. The teachers are, are very excited to um, especially I think one um, barrier or dilemma that always comes up for math instruction is that they always feel like they need to move forward through the scope and sequence, but there are still students that need some spiraled review. And this was kind of an aha, oh, this is kind of what we've been looking for to allow us to do that in a very personalized way. Um, so we're excited to onboard it and uh, really looking forward to seeing what it does for our math instruction. Kate, yeah. um, that I think one of the pieces that was really important too is that this is all done seamlessly, right? So you can have two students sitting next to each other working right. on very yep. different levels of every, math. Yep, every Nobody student, exactly, very discreet. Um, so one thing that I think was uh, just a real selling point for us is that the students are able to log into their own platform with their own user ID. And again, they could be working um, at their entry point on grade level standards while also either working um, either below the standard or above the standard anywhere along the K through 12 continuum. So you could have a student that is a fifth grade student by age and cohort that may need some uh, instruction at an early elementary level sitting next to a student that is at, at, in the grade five age cohort, but is working within high school standards um, in mathematics. So again, it's a, a very personalized learning pathway um, that they have their own path. Well, the teacher also sets up kind of a classroom path that they can push out different materials at differentiated levels. Um, but again, it can all be done um, right on the iPads. And so we, the appeal obviously was strong for us um, as we have been looking for tools like that during our remote learning model. So um, we're excited to have it. Great. Thank you. This yeah, we do not need approval on, but are there any questions? Okay. Thanks, Kate. I, I, 
This is Rachel. Sorry, I don't know if yeah. I'm on, on the screen. Um, so I have some experience with the IXL program. Is this yeah. uh, theoretically, if it pilots well, a replacement to that? So not because that's a great question. That was the, and, and the teacher's first question because they were like, what are you doing? Um, no, I, I don't see it as something. Um, it's definitely not going to replace it for this year. We're looking at both of them um, as learning tools that provide different types of, of instruction support. Um, what I do think is that this has the potential, should we use it with Fidelity, to maybe offer more, more than IXL offers. And so we're, we're really interested in seeing kind of this year, we'll be, uh, or next school year, we will be using both. Um, and then we will kind of take stock at the end of the year and see which one fit better for us. Um, I excel is really good at kind of that rope practice. This does have a component of that rope practice built in, in addition to the hands-on modules that will allow them to actually, you know, I was in a module, we were, it, it was building a graph and you could actually drag and drop and build the graph and use the tools. Um, so it was quite engaging and, and we're looking forward to it being something that will support the foundational conceptual understanding in mathematics and also that rote practice that's both so important in middle school. So it will be interesting to see how the students react to it. I know that the IXL does induce a lot of tears and frustration because it is pretty prescriptive it and, is pretty and not prescriptive. as as flexible. So yeah. I'm excited to see how the pilot goes for I am too. Thank you, Mrs. Abel. I am too. I am too. Yeah, we're excited about this and it really we see this as the extension from ST Math, which is giving you that yeah. kind of constructive struggle, um, but then also meeting students where they're at and being able to move them along the continuum. So we, we see this as, as more thinking and struggle versus the, the prescriptive rote um, of IXL. Um, but it would be good to be able to compare both and in the, in the, the information that this gives for teachers to, under, to be able to analyze how students are understanding is um, vastly more. Um, mm -hmm. broad than uh, IXL gives them. Great. Okay, we're moving on to our school improvement plans. Um, as you know, annually, we need to um, give an update to the school committee on uh, where we are with our school improvement plans. Um, oops, that did not I will, I'll be monitoring, but all of our principals uh, are here to actually do the presentations. Um, and we had quite a lengthy meeting in the last meeting uh, that talked about remote learning. So we will not be including that information again this evening, but we wanted to give you our um, update on school improvement plans. So as you know, we have our four goals uh, that you've heard us talk about all year. Um, whether we're doing budget or curriculum planning or um, strategic um, planning, we always link back to our four goals, engaged learning, rigorous and consistent curriculum, innovative practices, and school management. This year, we all had an um, unexpected goal plopped into our laps, which was that of remote learning. And we um, did speak about this and um, mentioned both synchronous and asynchronous teaching, student engagement, professional development, and the importance of SEL and relationships at our last meeting. So we won't be revisiting that information this evening. But as you know, as we're developing our district improvement plan and we're in the middle of a um, cycle, and so we, the same goals will be moving forward for next year, and then we'll be looking at what we need to do um, to either change or adapt or, or go deeper with um, goals that we've already established. The district makes their goals. Uh, that gets pushed out to the uh, schools and the principals then use those goals to develop their school improvement plans. And then our teachers and administrators take those school goals and that's how they make their individual um, teacher um, goals for the year. And so we're going to start with heirs and um, hear their update on how their school improvement plan goals went this year. Thanks, Dr. Flaherty. I just want to give a shout out to Megan Hart. Uh, she and I collaborated on this um, as she's moving into the interim position um, in the fall. So I um, just want to overview rather than read everything. Um, our three goals, one was based on um, inclusive practices. Another was based on rigorous learning. 
And then the third was based on uh, project-based learning where we really wanted to dig in and look at um, authentic assessments on those because we have been doing them for a while, but we wanted to make sure that we went back and made sure our assessments were in line. So some things I'd like to highlight here, um, especially under the first goal, was the number of uh, um, teachers that chose this particular um, area, inclusive practices, for their professional practice SMART goal. And we had nine out of 33 educators. And then if you go down to the next goal, we had 14 out of 33 choose the rigorous learning task, a professional practice goal. And that matters because that follows teachers through the evaluation process. And it also um, helps to move those initiatives forward because people are really super focused on them. Um, in the top goal, I also wanna point out, we had a major success this year um, and major kudos to Nikki Jakes Hughes, our ELL teacher. We brought five of our students who were classified as ELL, English language learners, um, who are now FELs, former English learners. And that is a major, major success for us. So I just wanted to point that out. Um, and also, I, thought, I know we weren't really gonna talk about remote learning, but how can we not? Um, under that top um, uh, goal, I wanted to just talk a little bit about the choice boards and the hyperdocs with multifaceted links that we afforded our students. Um, and just the, the, the choice and voice that came out of those learning opportunities have really helped with inclusive practices. The um, second goal, I already mentioned that we had a number of uh, teachers with that particular area of rigorous learning in their evaluation process. Um, and I just want to point out also that we had eight weeks of Scholars Club and 45 of our fourth graders took part in that early on in the school year. And that was super effective for their success as well. In the last one, um, the last goal about PBL, at this point, really the only grade level that still needs training is second grade. All of our other grades have been trained to this point. And um, I also wanted to point out this last point here around remote learning and how um, we've really had enhanced opportunities for PBL uh, where every grade level has offered um, at least one PBL since March 12th and we've had two to three per grade level um, really kind of step up and enjoy that with students. That's it for Ayers, thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Deborah. And now on to Betty Taylor for the high school. Thank you. Um, real quick, a couple of su some summary of accomplishments uh, that we achieved this year, despite our interruption. The Beacon program, which is the transition program for students who are going through hospitalization or have school avoidance issues, was up and running this year. Um, we have a counselor and a paraprofessional working with it, and they also connect with our Ladders program, which is one of our SPED uh, programs. We were really happy with the results, and um, we 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 have a good record of students being able to transition back into the classroom with lots of support. Um, we worked really hard this year on a vaping education program, um, working with um, the Beverly Hospital and the Be Healthy Beverly Commission. And we had um, worked with Beverly Hospital, had gotten a grant with an advertising agency and had students design anti-vaping campaigns. We were just in the last stage of that when we got interrupted, but that had been going ongoing, including student focus groups and posters in the classroom and in the um, hallway and um, beginning to develop, making sure students knew what kind of supports were there. My only hope is vaping has gone down while we've been away, but we were working really hard on that. Um, we um, continue to take advantage of the PASS program, which is uh, a program that uses McEwen, McKeon, excuse me, the, the, the youth center to, um, as, as an out of school suspension program. So instead of the kids, if they get out of school suspension being sitting at home, they go to this program, they have teachers there to help them make sure they're working on their curriculum. And they also have counselors there that sit down with them and talk to them about well, you know what happened in the why they why they got suspension and what other choices they can make. Um, we, we, this has gone into a really good partnership, and I think it's worked really well. Um, 
because the student isn't out of school that day, but there are consequences and a chance to reflect on um, any of their behaviors or actions. We've expanded our co-teaching teams again and developed them further and have given them time to, um, to plan and some training, um, further teacher training and project-based learning. Um, I believe it was 12 additional teachers got trained this year. And um, we did something where we're, um, uh, I have several teacher leadership teams that were doing research in different areas, which some of which I'll speak to in the other slides, um, but they started in September and have been working hard ever since. We haven't finished our work, but we are in good shape to pick up where we left off. Um, for the goal, the percentage of students in the lowest performing meeting the MCAS targets will increase. Um, the, um, the, uh, we have part of the, the plan for this to improve our, M, our MCAS scores for lowest performing was a, um, we began to use the LinkedIn service first with English. We were starting to do assessments so that we have a better sense of where student gaps are and we can target what's going on again. That got interrupted for the end of the year, but the English department's all set to get it up and going for uh, the fall and the math department will be doing it as well. Even more with this remote learning experience, it's, it's essential because we do need to assess our students and, and where their gaps are and where they'll need support and review. Um, I, I had the English, math, and, so, and science department work uh, after reviewing their data on MCAS, begin to develop specific lesson plans for review of skills. Um, for example, the English department um, designed particular writing prompts that um, use the um, same sort of type, question type as on MCAS, which is to take three sources of p p three pieces of, of, of writing and ask students to write in synthesizing the three in the writing prompt. Um, math revised their um, the study guide sheet that they had, and then again looked at sp uh, specific problems that they were going to make sure were reviewed before students um, took the MCAS um, and so there were strategies planned again that I do know they were doing them in the classroom uh, the long-term uh, effect of those are, remains to be seen but we'll continue that work um, for the next year the other one we took a look at is um, increasing uh, staff skills in social emotional learning we were looking for a 10% reduction in discipline referrals um, that data is incomplete. I, I do have to be honest, we weren't hitting the 10%. Um, so that's something we'll need to take a look at again. Um, but we did develop a lot of um, supports and resources with teachers. The co-teaching teams I spoke about were given professional development time and also that included consultation with Lisa Diker. Um, the teacher leadership teams um, were, there was one that was working on digital citizenship and digital literacy. Um, and they had a um, activities and some um, calendars, uh, excuse me, some activities that we were going to incorporate both into different subject areas in our advisory program. And the community service committee was looking at a sophomore year of service. They had started to do the rough sketch of it. And our intent was to have it up and running in September. We probably won't have it up and running for September, but we will continue to work and build on that so that we have an opportunity for students to be actively involved in community service their sophomore year. Um, I already mentioned the transmission program, the Beacon program was established. And we revised our advisory activity for all grade levels, aligning them with the uh, social emotional learning competencies. So each grade took on a different competency. You know, uh, freshman year was getting to know yourself and getting to, and by senior year it was getting to know uh, how you interact with the world. And there were activities all, all based around the SEL competencies. We implemented it this year year and we'll continue with that in the next year. Um, we also took a look at four articulate pathways with transition plans beyond high school. The Career Pathways Teacher Leadership Committee had worked at taking a look at what other schools were doing. Um, also looking at um, the, 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 the um, Department of Ed's 
um, recommendations for career pathways. Uh, we already have a business pathway, but we reviewed how to build that up. And they were taking a look at um, pathways in health science and, um, I'm sorry, environmental science. Uh, at the same time, we um, started having talks with the Essex uh, Tech, and we have established starting next year, we have 22 students enrolled in the Essex Tech co-op program. They'll be taking, uh, these are juniors, they'll be taking um, shop classes in the afternoon. Um, we're, I'm pretty sure that that's still feasible. Uh, for next year, and we'll just work with Essex Tech if you know, if there's remote learning issues and things like that. But the students will begin that program. F22 is a great response. I think it's the biggest. Uh, Essex Tech has partnerships with several area schools, but I think we had the largest number, um, and they've been very accommodating, and it's really turned into a nice partnership and a good opportunity for students. Um, the, the next step we need to do is to firm up our courses to make sure we have a through line of course for any of our pathways. As I said, the business department's in pretty good shape with that already, and uh, the science is getting there. We're um, probably going to add a couple of more things, but um, we should be able to recommend uh, pathways, career pathways, um, in the 21-22 yeah, uh, school year. Uh, what do we need? Um, the, the teacher leadership teams need to continue their work. They, they've made a lot of progress. Um, they lost a couple of months, so we would have been in slightly different shape, but we are not that far behind that we can't continue with our overall goals. Um, all that was interrupted, so we'll pick it up from where we are. In particular, the career pathways is something we're definitely going to because we need to be, be clear on our curriculum and our course choices. And social emotional learning obviously was a concern all along, but um, uh, we need we need to make sure we have a lot of strengths in that and a plan with an um, articulated uh, articulated. Um, I'm sorry, I'm losing my word choices. You know, sort of an articulation of where we're going and where the supports are and what students get in the classroom because we can certainly use that in remote learning as well as the regular classroom. Next steps. Oh, I thought I had more than one next step. But anyway, um, yeah, we're gonna refine the protocols and norms for remote learning as um, we work on instructional strategies. Um, I think we all know that there's a possibility that we may have to return to remote learning. And we did emergency learning. Um, I think the school did a good job. I think the district did a good job on that. But um, the feedback from both parents, teachers, and, st and students and staff is uh, sort of the procedures, the protocols, um, the norms. Um, we're all over the place, admittedly. What we're going to do, and I've already got an active group of teachers meeting with me for a discussion, discussion about that, is what are our norms and regular protocols so that if we go to remote learning again, we're much more streamlined and it's much more consistent for, for the student and the families. Thanks, Betty. And now we're moving on. Um, Kate Trombley will be doing the middle school. Hi, thanks, Dot. So we uh, have collected so a list of celebrations for both our um, school improvement goal one, uh, which was an academically focused goal, and then also school improvement goal two, uh, which will come up in a minute. Some of our celebrations is that we had an increase in PBL opportunities overall. Um, we feel as though we have had some opportunities for collaborative and robust cross interdisciplinary unit planning and instruction. Um, in particularly during this um, remote time, actually, we've had an opportunity for our teachers to spend some time collaborating and providing some really nice um, uh, cross curricular opportunities for students. So it was kind of one of the silver linings of, of, of this uh, pandemic and remote learning model. Um, BMS also onboarded me, uh, the Director of Innovative Practices, who has been working collaboratively uh, with teachers and teams to develop curriculum, including some of those authentic learning opportunities, as well as developing um, protocols for looking at student work and data. Uh, we are, have built strategically aligned building level and district-wide professional development opportunities. We have kind of taken um, those four pathways, and when we've had uh, building oppor uh, PD opportunities at the building level. We have really thought about the individual pathways um, that teachers chose and have also been trying to, um, in 
kind of a professionally developmental way, offer lots of different opportunities for students based on where, uh, for teachers rather, based on where they are in their career. So we've had a couple of nice PD days where we've had many workshops where teachers have been able to kind of um, choose their own adventure, if you will, uh, for professional development, which has been very successful for us. Um, we also have developed uh, walkthrough checklists in a very transparent way so that we can use those through our administrative walkthroughs for evaluation, but also really set kind of the expectations for teachers um, as far as the different look fors that we would be looking for in regards to those four um, professional development pathways. Our school improvement goal number two uh, was really around the um, kind of newly developed student expectations. Um, as you know, in the second year uh, as a new school, um, really bringing a focus to bringing that new school community together. So that was really um, the focus of uh, goal two. And on the next slide um, are a list of some of the highlights and accomplishments from this year. There has been a creation of the committee, committee for Community. Gosh, that's a tongue twister for this late at night. Uh, the Committee for Community. We uh, affectionately call them the C for C, C for C because that's much easier to say. Uh, so the C for C gets together um, biweekly to um, as a teacher team to help inform and um, guide any of our uh, cultural work that we're doing at the building. We also created a behavioral matrix and flowcharts and framing language um, documents that bring more transparency to behavioral expectations. Um, and those are all taught uh, during our Monday, our Mantra Mondays. So on Mondays, um, we bring the students together for um, a, an extended homeroom time where they are on team and uh, have designated time for social emotional work. Um, that has included um, the last bullet, which is Start With Hello, which is um, out of Sandy Hook Promise. And um, along all of these uh, lines, we have been highlighting a cool kid of the week. And you see a couple pictures there on the slide of some of our cool kids, um, students that have embodied our mantra, be cool, um, be brave, and BMS. So uh, that is a, our mantra that was developed um, along with students and teachers to kind of set the tone of our expectations and our culture of the middle school. Um, we also, we just felt like we needed to include some remote learning celebrations. Our teachers have worked tirelessly um, to provide some really nice opportunities for our students. We have really maintained a strong focus on the social emotional well-being of our middle schoolers. Um, again, I mentioned before, but we've been um, afforded the opportunity and kind of to echo what Deb had said, um, really having some time to pause similarly at the middle school to have some cross-disciplinary instruction and PBL opportunities um, while the students are learning from home. Um, so that has been a, a welcomed byproduct of this whole um, remote learning model. We also have really explored and uh, found great strategies that work for us, both using tech and also instructional practices. Um, to really bring some individuality and, and passion projects to light during this time. Um, and through that have really reinvented um, some of our global apps offerings, which is also pushing us to start to kind of um, reinvent some of what we're planning on doing in the fall in our global apps coursework. Um, so that has been, a, a, again, a, a celebration of the remote learning. Um, we do know that we still have a lot of work left to do. Um, we have been transparent about our partnership with DESI. We have uh, created um, an instructional leadership team with their leadership uh, along with us. And we have spent um, this school year really working on a root cause analysis regarding our lowest performing subgroups on math, science, MCAS. Um, through that, what we really have um, been able to do is work, work with our, our LinkIt team uh, team uh, that link it is our um, data warehouse system that we have onboarded um, K through 12. And so we have been able to work with the team from link it to make some really nice um, uh, and I had shared this at a school committee um, meeting earlier in the year, if I think some of you might remember that we've been able to have some comparative analysis of data looking at our MCAS scores and our building base assessments and really thinking about um, any of our subgroup discrepancies and really being thoughtful about making some action planning um, while also making social emotional connections to what we're seeing in the academic performance. Um, so that has, has been a, a nice partnership 
and um, we have really valued um, the coach that Desi has sent us and we have brought together what will prove to continue to be a really stellar instructional leadership team um, to help us move the work forward. Uh, the next steps for us are really around kind of universally designing our tier one instruction and utilizing best inclusive practices, including um, our robust co-teaching models. Um, we know that we still have work to do developing our uh, multi-tiered system of supports model with a strong focus on tiered instruction in math and science. Um, the Edmentum Exact Path product we think is going to fit nicely in that MTSS model as we look at personalized learning pathways for our students. Uh, we will continue to build upon protocols for data meetings and expanding our analysis um, of data to include more opportunities for collaboration and also really sitting down to look at student work. We are obviously a very large building and our grade level teams are very big. Um, one thing that has been on the forefront of our minds is calibration um, of student work and student performance. And knowing uh, this really kind of lends itself to the next bullet that we need to continue to oh, to develop our common assessments for performance and especially um, rubrics for our more authentic tasks like PBL, um, including some more common rubrics that can guide us as a building and as, um, as, as academic teams. Um, we know that we will continue to build our assessment and data, including some professional development for teachers. I think that's one area that it's taken a while for the leadership team to get comfortable with our Linkit data and using it. Um, we have expanded that out to our teacher leadership, and now it's ready. we're ready to really uh, make sure that all teachers are comfortable using data for instructional uh, purposes. We know we have a need to continue to track um, social emotional data so that we can use that. Um, that has been very important during our remote learning model. And I think we have been saying to ourselves, wow, we've really taken time and paused during remote learning to um, make sure that we have the means to track social emotional data in a way that is very useful for us and collaborative. We used to do it, but more siloed in different departments. We've been doing it in more of a collaborative collective way. Uh, and that is continuing to prove very powerful for us. And so uh, what started in remote learning um, cannot now be undone. And so we will continue to do that um, as we enter the next school year. And then also just really thinking about um, if we have that multi-tiered system support in academics, we also need to think about a multi-tiered system support for our um, climate. And that includes um, plans for social emotional wellness and kind of an expansion, an, an expansion of tiered social emotional supports, um, similar to the Beacon program that Betty has talked about. We are exp expanding our own program at the middle school to include um, a tiered social emotional team um, that will be also onboarding a teacher that will work alongside an adjustment counselor to um, help support that work. So that is looking forward to next year, whatever it looks like, um, that's the work we'll be doing. Thanks, Kate. Thanks. Um, and I believe now we're on to Centerville, Julie. Yeah, so are we gonna roll up to our updated slides? These are the slides from, yes, keep, keep going. So, all right, here we go, thank you. So first of all, good evening, everyone. I just wanna thank everyone for the, the great sharing tonight. It's been so enjoyable to listen to everyone. You know, at Centerville, we kind of chuckle to ourselves a little bit because as we, when we started this year, we were, we were setting out to have the best year ever. And um, I think up until being confronted with a global pandemic, uh, things were going quite well for us in terms of pushing growth for all students. So I will just share briefly some of the highlights that align to our goals that we set for ourselves at the end of last year. Um, initially, we addressed um, the matter of attendance in a, with, with some tiered interventions. And so we, we created a um, incentive program for our entire school through our house system. And then we really stepped up our monitoring of attendance and outreach with, with you know, monthly monitoring. And that really put us in the right direction and, and working more closely with families to, to have kids show up at school. Uh, secondly, due to our professional development with Lisa Deeker, our staff, we, we, we really adopted this, we are all co-teachers mindset at Centerville. And that really pushed us forward in aligning our curriculum and planning documents beyond our K2 phonics program. It, it really uh, allowed us to bring more people and more, more ideas 
um, to the table across all of our content areas in really cohesive and targeted ways. And we're really proud of that. That was something that was working so well for us. And finally, I will just add that um, it, it will always be the case that, that each year we seek new updates to our instructional units that allow for authentic project-based learning experiences, which you hear about um, from all of our leaders across the district. And uh, we will always look to add greater accessibility features through our focus on universal design for learning. You know, this really is the most you know, exciting part of the job as it's what keeps us energized and motivated from year to year. And uh, especially as we adopt new content standards. So I wanna just close by saying thank you to everyone for, for, to everyone for their support. Um, Beverly is a great district to work in and, and I feel really uh, encouraged and supported in the work that we do together. And I would just like to highlight, Julie, that through your three goals, um, really the thread that is the foundation of, of um, your success this year and being recognized by DESI for your uh, high growth. And uh, we, we are very proud of the work that, that your teachers and your team accomplished with that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Gabrielle, we're on to Hannah. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Um, for everyone's time this evening and it's been really excited to um, i've been excited to hear all the presentations this evening um and it's wonderful to see how closely aligned we all remain in our goals as a pre-k through 12 district that's always reinforcing um, so just a quick overview of our three goals for this year it was fantastic this year that all of our teachers chose um, one of these three goals for either their student learning goal or their professional learning goal. Um, so that really tied together all of our professional development work as well this year and of course, all of our evaluation work as well. So our first objective speaks to the reading growth across all genres of writing. And as we checked in on the mid-year growth, we saw significant growth, particularly in our subgroups from uh, grades one through four. Um, I just wanna highlight in particular the grade four win block, which stands for what I need. And our grade four team worked together to create on Fridays dynamic groupings which meant that students were um, mixed up across all of our fourth grade classrooms. Um, and there were skills-based groups so that students could have specific instruction by any one of the fourth grade teachers on an area in writing that they needed additional support with or that they were looking for additional challenge beyond the standard on. Um, that I would consider as a pilot going forward for the rest of our grade levels in the upcoming school year. And again, speaks to our UDL focus. Um, our object objective number two this year, uh, we're looking at our growth in math, um, expanding our use of ST math and puzzle talks, um, using the math journals across all grades this year. And again, as we did our check-in at the mid-year point, we saw that 82% of all Hannah students had completed at least 70% of the ST math program. Many students um, had already completed the syllabus at that point and were going on to the challenge level. We also enhanced our use of the box of facts this year and the mid-year check-in reflected growth for all students in the at-risk category. Finally, uh, PBL, you've heard it many times this evening across the district, we're all expanding our use of project-based learning. Um, and I will really echo back what my colleagues have said. Not only did we have project-based learning experiences um, continue through the remote learning period, but we moved into launch cycles at several grade levels so that they were fully underway with our PBLs, even in remote learning. And the incredible creativity and time that was spent on the culminating projects was fantastic. And one uh, really, you know, a bonus we couldn't have foreseen was that when the children were giving all of their presentations, sometimes we do it in a format where all the kids come together in the gym or the library, which can be sort of overwhelming or distracting. Um, but having that sort of one-to-one -one presentation when we're in a digital format was really exciting because the kids could really tune in and focus on their peers and ask great questions. So it was really exciting to see that growth continue. I wanna congratulate all of our Hannah students on the tremendous work they did during the remote learning period. They're really the heroes in all of this. And my congratulations to our very hardworking faculty. Thank you all for your time this evening. 
Thanks, Gabrielle. Now we're on to Lisa Oliver from Cove. Good evening, everybody. Uh, happy to be here tonight. And um, what I'm going to talk about tonight is a little bit of alphabet soup because I'm going to talk a little bit about UDL, a little bit about PBL, and a little bit about SEL. And you'll see that they kind of all overlap in what I'm about to present for this evening. Um, so you can see that our first objective was around reading. This was an area that we really wanted to focus on um, bringing in strategies from UDL and having students, um, we really focused on our economically disadvantaged kids and we were trying to close the gap. We used our faculty meetings, our grade level meetings, team planning time, um, to really look at our PBL units and to see how we could bring in the UDL components and refine the work that we had already done. Uh, we're fortunate to have everybody at Cove trained in PBL. Uh, was really pleased and proud of my staff over the summer with Lisa Diker. We had about 95% of the staff attend the training and that really showed in the work that they were doing this year. So you can see that as building objective two. Um, this is where they were refining the PBL units, as I said, and like all of my colleagues said, it was carried over into remote learning. But I, I have to say, I think that that's an area that we need to continue to strive to get better. It was emergency learning. Um, they definitely gave it their all and some PBL units were going well, but that would be the area that I would look to improve next year. Um, innovative practices is our final, and that's my SEL. Uh, really proud of Cove School for implementing the house system. Uh, and we continued to focus on um, the CASEL framework in our grade level meetings and planning times. Um, fortunate to have a fabulous adjustment counselor that was going into all of our classrooms weekly, if not weekly, every other week, and meeting with individual classes to help with the social skills of all students. Um, in closing, I just want to say I think this might be the last time that I present for Cove, which makes me a little sad um, because I'm so proud of the staff that I work with, but I'm also really excited to make the transition to the middle school and work with the administrative team over there. And they've been welcoming and just fabulous. So thank you. Lisa, you've been a great leader for Cove. Your, your school and your team has flourished. I know they're going to miss you desperately, but I, I know that uh, the middle school is very excited, as are we, um, to see what you'll bring in, in uh, working with that new team. So thank you for all of your hard work there. And I, I just want to chime in and say that 13 years I've been at Cove as a parent, and now that the last Ferretti has, is moving out, the timing couldn't be better <laughs> because we've enjoyed, you've been a phenomenal leader and the whole staff there, I echo what Dr. Flaherty has said, um, I'm just very happy that you'll be at the middle school. So <laughs> at least two of my kids, we can continue to work with you and, and look forward to uh, some more great things. Thank you, I really appreciate that. Thank Thanks, you. Lisa. And last but never least is mm -hmm. our North Beverly. Thank you for having me tonight. Um, I look forward to sharing a little bit of information about North Beverly. Um, in the past, we have spent some time really looking at our writing and we did a wonderful job improving our writing at North Beverly. So this year we were cycling around to look again at our reading instruction and what that looked like. So building objective one and two kind of all focus around that planning piece in terms of universal design for learning and inclusive practice and really spending the time. We had a lot of teachers that attended the training with Lisa Deeker last summer as well. Um, and really spending the time identifying different components of UDL that we would focus on, specifically looking at how do we um, look at reading comprehension and scaffold that for our students um, so that they're every student in our um, school is able to um, reach the expectations that they want them to, that we want them to reach and that's both taking in and reading the the information and understanding it and also then giving it back and being able to present their knowledge and so that was a big focus of ours this year and our teachers took that on and we're doing an absolutely amazing job with that 
Um, and that kind of carried over into our authentic learning, looking at our PBLs from last year and really kind of taking a lens with that and not kind of moving on yet, but going back and saying, how do we make these better? What does that look like for all of our students? How are they all able to meet the objectives that we want them to be able to reach in a high level of learning, really rigorous learning? And that's one thing I have to say, um, my teachers at North Beverly are about rigorous learning and they want students to be able to, all of them be able to achieve at a very high level. So we've spent a lot of time on that this year. They've done an amazing job and I certainly think it um, will show this year and next year in just um, all of our data that will, will come forth. Also kind of looking forward to um, the, this next year, what that will look like. We spent a lot of time at North Beverly this year in remote learning looking at um, that synchronous learning. We found a lot of engagement where a lot of my teachers did quite a bit of small group instruction with their students, um, finding a lot of benefit from that, from parents really enjoying that, kids getting a lot um, from that because they were in small groups, learning material and able to interact with the teacher. And we found that very important. And um, so we focused a lot on that, meeting students where they were, what their needs were. And that was kind of our focus for the year. And finally, social emotional learning, um, really just kind of focusing in on what our students need, that real explicit instruction outside of just the classroom. So um, much like um, Centerville and um, Cove, we had the house system this year, which was, again, students from different grade levels together working on different topics. So, you know, we would tackle different things um, like empathy and ideas of empathy and do that where the older kids were working with the younger kids and really kind of um, modeling what that looked like and sharing ideas and then being able to support each other in the whole school environment. So now, those were some of the things we did this year. Proud of my staff, they've done a great job. Great teamwork. Thanks Erin for all your hard work. Um, and as Erin had mentioned, and then uh, we heard in, in several of the other schools as well, the work of Lisa Diker. Um, I'm really excited that over the um, remote closure, we were able to provide a professional development opportunity where um, Dr. Diker came and did a um, virtual webinar that our entire staff will be um, watching before the end of school. And so that will allow us to really have some common skills and column knowledge um, from all of our staff, administrators, teachers, paraprofessionals, um, pre-K through 12. Um, and I think that, that we're gonna see um, that impact uh, next year as we start our work together in the fall. Any questions for our principals? We are very lucky to have an amazing group of um, building leaders. And um, I thank you all because the work that you've done, not only in remote learning, but every day is really head and shoulders above um, a team that I've worked with ever in my career. So I thank you all for uh, your efforts and the work that you do with your individual teams in your buildings. All right, and now it's not moving forward. Sorry about that. It took a minute to get back to the, uh, <laughs> the original um, slide deck. Um, so that is the end of our presentation on school improvement plans. Uh, we do not have many handbook changes, but we did have one um, that was sent out um, earlier today. So uh, I apologize if um, people didn't have a chance to look at it. Um, but this is language that uh, was recommended to us from um, Ms. Uh, Spolansky, our um, pupil personnel and special ed director. And this is new language um, that should have been um, updated and needs to be incorporated into handbooks um, at all levels. And it's around discipline for students with disabilities. And so this is uh, the one piece of language that we do need to have a recommendation um, to um, adopt so that the it can go to the whole school committee next week and that principals can work on updating the language in their handbooks for the fall. Um, Dr. So Flaherty, like do you want to make the motion? I was just going to do that. I would <laughs> like to make a motion that we accept the 
uh, handbook language uh, to change for um, our handbooks elementary through high school um, in regards to discipline and students with disabilities. Okay, and I'll second that. And I think we'll need a roll call vote. Yeah. Ms. Freddy? Yes. Ms. Abel? Yes. Mr. Conan? Yes. Dr. Flaherty? Yes. Ms. Hildreth? Yes. Ms. McGuire? Is she here? Oh, is she? I think she might have um, oh, dropped maybe off. She OK. All right. And uh, Ms. Sudak? Yes. OK, so that passes six and then four absent. Thank you. And then finally on our agenda, um, I wanted to give you some preliminary results. Uh, we will have a, all of the results on the website later, um, oops, next week. Uh, and knowing that this was gonna be an extremely um, dense meeting with a lot of great information, uh, we didn't want to, um, this could be a, a whole presentation in and of itself with the, the vast amount of data that we received. But I did want to give you um, a flavor of the major topic areas that we looked at. And you can see that they, um, you'll be able to see that there's quite a bit of consistency um, in some of the trends that you see uh, from both our students and from our parents. So um, the data that I'm going to present to you tonight is uh, preliminary. It does not uh, answer all of the questions um, or data that we um, accumulated back, but it will give you a good sense of the key areas uh, that we were looking at. This was a uh, survey that was sent to um, parents and guardians and uh, teachers filled one out as well. We'll uh, also have that data on the website um, once we have a chance to finish analyzing it. And it went to students in grades five through 12. And you'll see that we adapted the key pieces for our little ones as well, thanks to uh, Megan Hart. She helped design that survey that went out to our students in K through four as well. Uh, we did have very good um, results and um, the responses. Uh, when you start to look at surveys, these numbers were very strong. Uh, we will also do another survey um, as we, after we hear the guidance from the commissioner and as we start to formulate plans for next year, we'll be um, seeking some further uh, responses back from our parents and um, help us with our fall planning. So this just gives you a, a breakdown of the grade levels and you can see uh, the 12th grade and preschool were a little bit lower than everybody else, but the rest of the um, responses were fairly equally distributed across all of our grade levels from both um, students and parents. One of the questions um, and the first question that we looked into was food sufficiency or food insufficiency so that we could try to connect with families that may be struggling. And you can see that uh, overwhelmingly 93% of parents and 90% of students agreed or strongly agreed that they had enough food, but we also had the capability for parents to uh, write their name in or students to write their name in if they were struggling or if they needed or wanted help in connecting with um, other agencies or areas where they could um, access food. We did ask about um, social and emotional health. Um, the overall, um, it was fairly consistent. Parents answered a little bit higher um, with agree or strongly agree that their students, uh, that their children appeared happy and healthy during the closure. Uh, then the students reported, uh, it was 66.5% of, um, of parents either agreed or strongly agreed. And it was about 48% of our students in grades five through 12. I actually think our, our little guys are the ones that were missing school the most. Um, and you can see that they were only about 30% that agreed that learning at home um, had been good for them. And you can see that we, for them, used smiley faces. And you'll see in a few minutes uh, later on that we used either thumbs up or thumbs down. So it's not exactly um, transferable to the, to the same um, amount of choices that the other categories had, but we did want to look at the same broad categories. Um, and you can see that we have a, a group where they were also allowed to answer um, 
their own questions, you know, with words versus just choosing one of the smiley faces. And you'll see that most of those responded that it was somewhere in the middle. So some of it was good, some of it was bad. So they didn't um, choose either way. Um, and some of them were bored. So they were, they were missing school and they were missing it, especially their friends, which came out in um, a different question. So then we wanted to ask about the amount of schoolwork um, that children were receiving at home. And from parents, about 75, 77% um, said it was just about right or almost right, or they wished that they had just a little bit more. But um, in general, they thought it was about the around amount of work. 12.7% thought that the students received um, too much work and about 10% didn't think that students received enough work. Um, you'll see that it's fairly consistent with our students as well. So, you know, three quarters of our um, parents and students that answered the survey felt like that the work was just about right. Um, although the students um, have a much bigger category of thinking that um, they had too much work to do. So um, that was interesting to, to look at there as well, about a third of them. And then when we asked our um, littlest friends, uh, again, they were pretty similar uh, in that the 65% thought that it was great and then 21% um, thought that uh, it wasn't so good and then there was a lot of responses that said it was somewhere in the middle. We then wanted to know about access to technology and this comes with the caveat um, that this data is skewed by the fact that if they were answering the survey, then they had access to technology and it may not incorporate our families that were um, struggling uh, for either hotspots or to have access. Um, and so we need, we need to remember that as we're looking at this because it's very, um, very strong that, um, that students had access when they needed it. Um, many students, um, parents were at 77.3%, students had their own computer or they shared but really got to use it whenever they needed it. Um, there was very few students that said that they didn't, um, they weren't able to get to a device in their home um, when they wanted it um, from the parents perspective. And this was even stronger when we looked at students. And we need to remember that our um, seventh and eighth graders um, all have iPads and our high school students have their laptops. And then we were able to distribute devices to our fifth and sixth graders. So this shows that um, our students in the five through 12 um, group really did have their own devices and access whenever they needed it. Um, to do their work or to get onto their um, classrooms. And then the same, that was very consistent when we looked at our students that answered the survey in grades K through four, over 95% of them said that they had no problem getting a device when they needed to do their work. As you know, so, uh, social emotional learning, um, and especially in the times that we were in, the anxiety and um, just the change of, of being remote, we wanted to make sure that students were feeling cared for. And so one of the questions that we did ask was um, from both parents and then students, that te teachers have demonstrated a high level of caring and compassion for students during the closure. And you can see that uh, this was extremely high um, from both of our groups and highest from parents. 85% of our parents agreed or strongly agreed that um, they had received caring and compassion from the adults. And only 5% um, disagreed or strongly disagreed. And then with the students, again, it was over 75% um, that agreed or, or strongly agreed and 6.5% um, that did not agree. So very consistent trends there. And we are very grateful to our educators um, because this really was the leading before, especially in the beginning, before anybody focused on um, the academics, we wanted to make sure that, that our students were safe, that they were fed and that they were feeling cared for. Then we asked about interactions with teachers. This was probably one of the areas that were that struggled a little bit in the beginning because there were so many changes. The first two weeks, it was just about engagement. And then it went to um, 
more asynchronous where people were leaving um, videos that students could watch. And then two weeks later, it transitioned to the last time. And that's when we went into synchronous new learning and seeing teachers. Um, so this was the, the area that changed the most throughout the survey, but still very positive um, responses. Uh, from our parents, uh, about 56% said that they thought it was about the right amount of uh, interactions with teachers. And that jumped up when we looked at students to almost 75%. Um, with parents, there was a split, about 40% wished they had been a little bit more interaction. And that dropped dramatically because it was so much higher for students. That was only at 11.6%. Um, the kids were actually higher when they thought they had too much interactions um, with teachers, which was at 8.6, and 5% had, had said reported that they had not had any interactions with teachers at that point. Remember, this was done, this survey was done in the um, beginning to middle of May. And when we asked um, our K through four students, 92% of them gave it a thumbs up that they um, got to see their teachers and peers um, online during the week. And that, that was uh, what was making them very happy. And it was only uh, less than 1% that said that it wasn't enough time for them. And then the last area that we're gonna focus on tonight was um, looking at feedback from teachers. So how were uh, students and parents feeling about the amount of feedback teachers were providing for uh, their students. And about 68% of our parents said it was just about right. About a quarter would have liked more. Um, and uh, around 6% said that they hadn't received feedback. So again, very positive trends there. And it was almost um, mirrored by um, our students, which was a little bit higher at 72% that had said that they had received about the, the right amount of feedback and 20% that wished that they had received a little bit more um, and around 5% that had said that they had not received feedback yet. And when we get those results, um, that was information that we shared with principals and so that we were able to follow up. The, these were anonymous, so we didn't know exactly who um, the teachers may have been, but it was a general statement to making sure that, that we were um, changing with the time. So in the beginning, uh, there wasn't any interactions the first couple of weeks, and it could have been um, perceptions that came from that time, and that did change over time. So I think that we would... Um, expect to see even higher numbers, um, although these are very positive, we would expect to see even higher numbers in a follow-up survey. Any questions about the preliminary results? And Mrs. Ferretti, I think that's all I've got for you tonight. I know, thank you. That was, this is a, a wonderful meeting and I can't believe it's our last of of the year. Of this year, yes. We won't be meeting again until the fall. I don't know. We well, could still plan to meet and just talk about how our summer is going. <laughs> I just want to take a moment to thank um, all of our members, uh, both our school committee and our community members and our students. I wish our students were here so we could have thanked them for some of their good insight and, and thought-provoking questions that they, they, they made us consider throughout the year. And we know that you could all be doing something else on uh, the first Wednesday night of the month. And I'm very grateful that you um, come and spend your evening with us so that you can help to, to shape the work in the future of the Beverly Public Schools. Yes, thank, thank you, Dr. Flaherty. This is, uh, I would say, one of my favorite meetings as a school committee person. I get to hear of all the wonderful things that are happening in each of our schools and it just reinforces uh, how I feel that you know we just have the best leaders. We have the best uh, people in all our schools, and I'm just so proud to to say Beverly is is uh, where I'm at, and all my kids are at. So thank you. Um, if there's no other questions, and I'll, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right. And I'll second. Thank you, Mrs. Abel. All right, so we will take a roll call vote. Okay, Ms. Ferretti? Yes. Ms. Ebel? Yes. Mr. Conan? Yes. Dr. Flaherty? Yes. Ms. Hildreth? Yes. Um, and Ms. McGuire? And Ms. Sudak? Yes.
All right, the motion passes. Thank you. All right, so we are adjourned at 8.51. Thank you all very much and enjoy your summer. Have a wonderful summer and we'll see you in October. Thanks. Good night, everybody. Bye.